Ladies and gentlemen, even though Professor Rangabhi Samada is uh, very famous, but I think uh, we still need to make a proper introduction. Uh, Professor Rana, Rana B. Samada, uh, distinguished chair professor at the Mahat Nirmalamban uh, Calcutta Research Group. Uh, his extensive research uh, encompasses a wide range of critical subjects, including and um, not limited to nationalism, post-colonial statehood, peace studies, migration, refugee studies, and labor studies. And he touches upon cross-border labor movement and the reshaping of technology's impact. Through his prolific scholarly contribution, he continuously challenges established notion of nationalism and also the landscape of critical post colonial thought reshaping. With an impressive bibliography of 24 authored books, uh, 32 edited journal volumes, and more than 200 uh, journal articles. His scholarly contribution stands as profoundly impactful. His books, including The Politics of Dialogue, Beyond Calcutta, uh, uh, Karl Marx, The Post-Colonial Age, and The Pandemic, and The Politics of Life, and the recent publication, Alternative Future, and the Present, Post-Colonial Possibilities. They, in, they in illuminate the path toward re-evaluating aspects of all things that concern us. As an educator, he has been emphasized Sizing on critical thinking. And his contribution has been instrumental in shaping the peace studies movement within Southeast Asian academia, but also uh, beyond, around the world. Uh, personally, I find Professor Samadang's critical interpretation of Karl Marx and its implication on global capital dynamics colonial expansion and the intricate connection between colonialism and nationalism to be exceptionally impressive and inspiring. His meticular, meticulous analysis of the relationship between law enforcement and civil unrest during the Calcutta City riot in 1946 is extremely uh, touching and inspiring, especially to me, when we think of the relation between populism and this uh, nationalism joined together. So that is still uh, a question for all of us. I ask you, all of you, to join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Ronald <laughs> Sanada. Initially, I had thought of uh, you know speaking from notes and I need to make it very formal. But then this request came that for interpretation, uh, is it okay now? Or? Uh, closer. Closer. Okay. Uh, but then the request came that I should give a written text so that uh, the interpretation is uh, uh, is uh, easier. Otherwise, it would be difficult. So therefore. Much though I would not like to read out from a written text, but here is what it is. And I am thankful to the organizers. I am also thankful in particular because this is an evolving uh, thought. And I was telling Sandro, he gave me the opportunity to uh, spell out my ideas, which were in very raw form. Uh, last March in Genoa, and with Star Night, uh, he said, "Are you becoming a little liberal? What has where has gone your critical theory?" 
So, Sandro, I hope you will bear with me. Uh, the lecture, and so therefore it gives me an opportunity to flesh out the ideas and concretize it a little more. The uh, title is Solidarity and the Practical Ethics of Care and Protection. The discussion on responsibility is full with philosophical, quasi-philosophical, sociological and legal reflections, while political reflections and analysis is relatively less. This is because political power is suffused with the idea of sovereignty and very little with responsibility. A theory of separation of powers and the constitutional principle of division of powers imply responsibility as an intrinsic element of legitimate authority. There is also the doctrine of sovereignty with responsibility. Yet, power is measured not by responsibility, but by its reach. That is to say, where it meets the constraints or fetters of it. Power is transgressive and is therefore inherently violent. Even though power is honed with prudence to be exercised in a measured manner, yet it has the capacity to turn itself into a center, a univocal sovereign signifier of capacity. A capillary existence of power by itself does not guarantee federalization of political power, or to be precise, its existence in a responsible mode. The study of responsibility as an essential component of politics has suffered from a top-down approach. Posing from the margins the question of responsibility in a post is a post-colonial way of critiquing the organization of power. A post-colonial framing of responsibility will mean taking into account the background of decolonization, partitions, structural reforms, environmental disasters and neoliberal development against which population flows continue and biopolitical responses from below to events of crisis. It is important to study local dynamics of power and responsibility in protection of the victims of forced migration. We need to study local and variegated experiences of refugee protection because there is a greater burden of protection at the micro level at the margin. We need to study the neglected histories of sovereignty as responsibility. The dual figure of migrant and refugee has emerged as a Oh, it's, it's so is there something that can be like maybe like this? We need to study the neglected histories of sovereignty as responsibility. The dual figure of migrant and refugee has emerged as a significant subject under conditions of globalization, aggressive wars, transgression of borders, and a political economy that allows differential inclusion of migrant labor. In this context, post-colonial experiences suggest plural responsibilities for protection and hospitality. And it means that we must accept legal pluralism and regional mechanisms as the foundational principle for rebuilding the the structure of protection. The salient feature of this situation at the margins is that there is no transfer of will here from the ruled to the ruler or the other way around. unpredictable ways. Responsibility becomes essential to the government of the living, within quote. Moral res mutual responsibility creates a community. It becomes the name of a solidarity, the name of a collective. Solidarity is a sense of the common and a stake in the production of responsibility as a collective virtue. Now the second section. Solidarity grows out of what I term here as practical ethics. 
that is to say, conduct as contingent, historical, and growing out of practical considerations in the wake of a crisis. The experiences of COVID-19, at least in India, demonstrated this out as never before. COVID-19 brought out, among others, a strong pattern of solidarity in the public life of the subalterns. The impact of social practices of subaltern solidarity spread to other sections of population. In the first year of the COVID crisis, 2020, information on the condition of the migrant workers, workers employed in logistical services, caregivers, people living in slums and shanty settlements, and the activities of various solidarity groups involving these sections of population enthused many more in the second year of the pandemic, 2021, noticeably in the wake of the Delta variant causing havoc globally. In India, the Delta variant spread like wildfire, creating what was called the oxygen crisis. Once again, solidarity groups sprang up throughout the country, involving members of victim families to relay and coordinate information on availability of oxygen cylinders, beds, nurses available to serve at home, and most importantly, food. Youth teams became prominent. As in the emergence of solidarity with the migrant workers, in 2021, solidarity became likewise the moment of link between the victims and the society. The link moment symbolized the dramatic changes unfolding before the society. In moments of crisis, popular mechanisms of solidarity activates. There was no inherent and given mechanism. Practices of solidarity borrowed from popular memory to respond to pressure in ways people were already familiar with. For instance, the historical tradition of mutual aid, empathy, protection, and collective ways coping with adversities. Came to life. In some sense, these are routine coping strategies of a society. However, in such crisis, at least in a crisis like the COVID-19, society witnessed the emergence of these strategies of solidarity at expanded scale. Thus, as never before, India witnessed the emergence of what we call the frontline workers. Doctors, nurses, paramedical staff, ayahs, ASHA workers, that is accredited social health activists, waste disposal workers, community workers of various types, and now increasingly intrepid reporters who became heroes and heroines in the landscape of solidarity. Solidarity reflected a form of social capacity that was in excess of that of the ruling order. The said capacity was always on the frontier, always gesturing the society to what was possible, but unrealizable in the banal time. Experiences of such a surge of solidarity were a kind of renaissance of a social spirit seen in the colonial time when cooperatives, mutual aid associations, literacy, medical, and medical aid movements, and flood relief campaigns marked the nationalist spirit. We shall come to that around, to that account soon. An overwhelming sense had encouraged these efforts in the colonial time, namely that life of the people under colonial rule was in grave danger. Solidarity, <coughs> in short, <coughs> is a life question, but one of life at its limits. Solidarity reflects the biopolitical nature of a collective at a time of crisis. Solidarity is life in crisis. The paradox is striking because it is through the acts of solidarity that a collective comes into being. There is no pre-given collective. And we may leave out here the anthropological explanations of a collective, even though those explanations too tell us of practices of solidarity contributing in the making of a collective. At least politically speaking, there is no collective without solidarity. At the same time, the collective inherent differences without which an act of solidarity cannot take, take, take shape. 
one cannot have solidarity with oneself, which also means that a collective would have differences within. Yet, in the time of the crisis, to remember again, crisis of life as a collective, that acts of solidarity emerge. One aspect of the acts of solidarity, like the ones referred to me just a while ago, was the nature of social leadership, which activated the ethical as well as institutional mechanisms of solidarity. Thus, a political activist of a locality, a village headman, or a woman with restless spirit appreciated and admired by the society, a school teacher, a slum leader, a club secretary, they were all instances of social leadership. They produced solidarity from below. They also demonstrated the ethical dimensions of solidarity. Thus, they, have, they may have added, aided someone in distress, insisted on providing shelter to a person in need, taking a sick individual to a hospital, raising resources to save the needy in crisis, recognizing dignity of the vulnerable, or carrying a dead body in the COVID time somewhere in a desolate place by villagers in, in fear of the virus to do the last rites. There was something in common in a, to an ethical act like these and politics, namely the element of risk marking the act of solidarity. We can think in the same breath of Florence Nightingale and the members of the international brigades in the Spanish War who perished in battles in Spain. We are told 15,000 out of 50,000 members. Acceptance of risk was soon acknowledged as the first condition of hospitality and solidarity. It was a unique way to establish friendship. Clearly, solidarity in a time like this signified a dream of something more than the official declarations of impending victory over COVID. Solidarity's dream was provoked by the crisis of time, which also became the time to communicate with the nameless and faceless fellow human beings. No could have more apt communicated the urgency of the dream than the invocation of the crisis, an extraordinary reality. Dissolution of life and the desire to save others. The two recurrent strains of the time express the meaning of the COVID years. They also spiritualized an essentially dangerous act, the act of dreaming a safe future by those who felt their fate was sealed. Who incidentally, and he could be a worker in a gas station, who would otherwise take his ordinary van out, turn it into a carrier of deceased bodies due to COVID, ferry the bodies to the cremation gown, when governments were not allowing even the nearest to see the his or her dearest one after he or she has died. The acts of solidarity also showed how current history produces its supplement. Though we must remember that friendships do not do away with hierarchy. An ethical act of hospitality by itself does not create a chain of equal and equivalent relationships. Like solidarity with the victim does not assume non-discrimination. Reciprocity may be a symbol of solidarity, but reciprocity is conditional. Each reciprocal act produces life, reproduces life on the existing template of life. Ethical acts of solidarity by themselves do not end discrimination. The ethical virtue in this way is contradictory from within. The transformation of the social and ethical acts of solidarity into political will to unite depends very much on an understanding of the paradoxical nature of solidarity. As the Indian experience showed, contingency, difference, mutual aid, ethical imperatives, and the sense of a common goal, these attributes of solidarity did not, sit co did not coexist in a seamless manner. Solidarity, therefore, and not surprisingly, was often marked with tensions. Solidarity, therefore, is not a pure ethical act of selflessness. It is guided by a sense of responsibility, a notion of what may be called practical ethics. Because of the paradoxes in the political conduct of the subaltern classes 
we must pay closer attention to the notion of practical ethics, by which I mean ethical conduct which is contingent, event or issue-based, led by considerations of solidarity, affinity and friendship, predicated on time and not guided by an eternal ethical command belt. Making of a solidarity and discharge of responsibility for care and protection have much to do with a sense of practical ethics. Solidarity of the lower classes differs markedly from that shown by upper classes of society for whom, within quote, mobilizing in the interest of others is a virtue of our time. I'm actually, uh, I read out the caption of an issue of Telos. Creating a new moral economy has been an enterprise of social rulers for ages. Ironically, the proposal for a new moral economy vindicates the argument of crisis and conjuncture because such proposal admits that technological, political, economic, demographic, institutional, and ideological transformations in late 20th and early 21st century clumsily put together under the title neoliberalism have rendered the old moral framework of society unworkable. Homo economicus is sought to be revised into a new model of human behavior that will acknowledge humans as social animals. Humans who are rational, but also enmeshed in social connections that influence their thinking and actions. There has to be thus a new collective goal of a society and a revised series of measurement of success. Protection of particular interests will be redesigned into a mechanism for, protection, for betterment of all. In short, a new moral political economy, moral economy will be the basis of new policies, practices, and rules of the game, including those that can cope with unpredictable changes and make use of such changes. We can see thus how neoliberalism is keeping up with the game. It is also a response to the crisis of life, a response from moralists, theorists, philosophers, and social theorists. In this response, there is silence over poverty, inequalities, abject life conditions, and most importantly, over the issue of responsibility. This silence over responsibility is built into the theorization of a new moral economy. The trouble is that the lower classes are not infused by such grand moral plans. Or if you like, they do not fall for the ruse of flourishing of all within court and the emergence of morality as, within quote, truly representing commonly held values. For self-mobilization of a collective has been often for physical survival. Solidarity has been predicated by circumstances, such as conjuncture of events and forces, an intermittently appearing crisis of life. It is thus an issue of practical ethics, which is anchored to life that is at stake and not to any new moral economy, or for that matter, any chain of classical values. In such background, a capillary existence of power, effectively meaning federalization of political power, will denote the existence of power in a responsible mode. This leads us to a pressing question. With what should one begin a politics of responsibility? The answer is, there is no immanent causality in a process claiming to be transformative. In the perspective of our discussion, solidarity practices of care and protection, which will transform global governance and will signal a new ethics of responsibility. Take the case of the Refugee Convention of 1951, which created an institutionalized power to protect. But this creation was not a transformative event. The power to protect, which does not yet exist, is made possible only by thinking within the empty space of lack of protection. Of the dark story of victimhood, vulnerability, and death. For Machiavelli, the prince emerged as the meeting point of fortune and virtue. Similarly, the time of the lower classes of society, living in near permanent precarious conditions, is one of contingency. Ethics of protection faces a void. Ideology cannot make sense of the void. Crafting a theory of responsible power in the neoliberal time begins from that void from which 
the contingent practices of care and protection emerge. This is what the society witnessed in the time of COVID-19 when the idea of responsibility towards fellow beings materialized as if from nowhere on a wide scale. Responsible power, in short, is not to be understood as a moral power, but power suffused with wisdom. Many ancient tracts portray not mystical ideas about responsibility, but purely practical accounts, be it the Mahabharata, the great Indian epic, take the two chapters, uh, Drona Parbo and Shanti Parbo, or Cicero's account in On Duties. Cicero pointed out, A, help to others may originate from a wide sense of how to exercise power prudently. The way to make power prudent. And B, there has to be an idea of commons, something others can share. Those exercising power must know that others can partake of the commons. Hospitality has less to do with morality, but with practicality. And this is different from the liberal idea made famous, among others, by Immanuel Kant, that the supreme principle of morality is a principle of practical rationality, in his words, a categorical imperative. Categorical imperative is an objective, rationally necessary, an unconditional principle to be followed by us despite any natural desires we may have to the contrary. All specific moral requirements, according to Kant, are justified by the principle of categorical imperative, which means that all immoral actions are irrational because they violate the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is the fundamental principle of morality and is nothing but the law of autonomous will. We are not slave to passion. Our moral philosophy will appeal, will allow for a conception of reason whose reach in practical affairs goes well beyond passion. In the philosopher's language, responsibility will become a part of the government of the self and others." Unquote. Moral philosophy has a function here. Its function is to reveal an inner duty, the truth of our commitment to others. The colonial idea of responsibility was exactly opposite to this, or represented this. In the colonial time, the Home Ministry in London was responsible for Indian affairs. The Indians were responsible to the colonial government for their good conduct. And the Crown was responsible for making India civilized. Thus, famines created dispute among the colonial rulers as to who was responsible for mass hunger. And also for the determination of eligibility for getting food aid. Lord Lytton, for example, was unwilling to shoulder the responsibility of feeding thousands of hungry Indians during the Deccan famine, 1876 to 78, and opted for a strictly eligibility norm. The famine courts of 1880s were not a sign of admitting responsibility of the Crown, but one of expediency. Thus, displaced Indians were to be herded in camps so that food could be distributed conveniently, and hungry Indians would not converge in towns and riot. The measures were punitive and immensely restrictive. Yet, colonialism impelled Indians to realize a bond which inspired them to work for solidarity and launch mutual aid commitment for aid campaigns. For instance, from 1870 to 1922, North Bengal had witnessed as many as 25 massive floods, resulting in huge loss of crops, property, and lives of cattle and human beings. The devastating flood in the Rajshahi division was caused by heavy rainfall in the entire North Bengal on 22 to 26 September 1922. Nationalist leaders like Shubhash Chandra Bosch visited the affected areas. Bengal Relief Committee with the famous scientist P.C. Ray as its president was formed quickly by various organizations within the Calcutta University Science College campus as its headquarters. Other scientists, including the famous physicist Meghnath Shah, then a professor in Allahabad University, 
join. Nearly 200 volunteers, including students and teachers, endangered their own lives when working as volunteers. <coughs> Once again, in the 1929 flood in the Pavna district, P.C. Ray, the famous chemist, arranged for relief with the help of Suri. The Bengal famine occasioned a surge of solidarity action undertaken by communist activists. The Malaria Prevention Cooperative Committee was formed in 1923. We have numerous instances of practice of responsibility. But I will close with something probably more significant. More significantly, in 1950, two warring countries, Pakistan and India, parts of one country, same country, only three years back, concluded a pact, the Nehru Liaquat Ali Pact, committing the two countries to protect minorities who belonged a few years back to each other's country. The pact was a bilateral treaty between two countries. It allowed refugees to return and dispose of their property. Abducted women and looted property were to be returned and minority rights were confirmed. The pact also introduced visa system for refugees and minority commissions were set up in both countries. More than one million refugees migrated from East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, to West Bengal in India. It was not a perfect or a fully satisfactory solution. And the nationalist leaders of two countries gradually forgot their mutual commitments. Yet, the significance of the gesture of responsibility could not be mistaken. The legacy of mutual responsibility among the colonial people weakened in time. But the legacy helped sustain a fragile peace among two feuding states for one and a half decade in the post-independent period. Some termed the effect as, within quote, animosity at bay, unquote. We can recall in this context periodic efforts by Gandhi to protect the endangered minorities in the time of communal violence, most symbolically by undertaking indefinite fasts. In January 1948, he started the last fast of his life. He laid down two conditions for ending his fast. The first, for communal amity. All mosques and houses belonging to the Muslims in Delhi were to be vacated and handed over to them. The second, the government of India was to pay to Pakistan rupees 55 crores as its share of the treaty at the time of partition. The government met both conditions, but as we know, Gandhi had to pay for this settlement with his life. This is not to say that cohesion makes nation's conduct responsible. There is no pre-given cohesion of the nation. The nation is permanently dissatisfied with its degree of cohesion. The space of the cohesion of nation is contentious. Race and ethnicity in various ways inform nation's membership. Thus, there is an eternal specter of the alien haunting the nation. Even in a settler's colony like the United States, where the indigenous population groups were nearly annihilated and marginalized, who is an American invites racist answers. Cases were fought in the courts of law in the 19th century to decide whether Hispanics were rightly the nationals of the United States. In a rigorous study of the race question in Greece, Sevasti Trubeta has shown the way physical anthropology, race, and eugenics functioned to make the Greek nation, which was pure and different from non-Greeks. Hence, the debate raised among Greek anthropologists who was a non-Greek, thus who was a minority, who was an outsider, who an alien. These crucial questions at governance depended for their resolution on the discovery of who was a Greek. A Hellenic figure spread <coughs> across the Asia Minor, different from Slavs and Turks, an authentic European maintaining continuity with the classical time. The theme of responsibility in this way tells us of contentious politics. Nevertheless, there is much to learn from the anti-colonial repertoire of responsibility. At least 
we can note this. Solidarity accounted to a large extent in the practices of responsibility in the anti-colonial milieu. To be truthful, in politics, solidarity and responsibility have always gone hand in hand. The prince was responsible for the protection of his subjects because they formed a people without whom the prince was inconsiderable. The nation is responsible because people make the nation. I will just read out the last paragraph. There is clearly I had a section on Ambedkar, how Ambedkar defined responsibility, because Ambedkar said that while we have to continue social struggles for ending of caste, but he says that we have to learn from liberals, because liberals tell us how to be responsible in exercising power. This was Ambedkar's own idea, and how Ambedkar tried to combine a discourse of responsibility with the discourse of social justice, that is something maybe uh, more interesting for those who are uh, studying Indian politics. But in general, I think what I have argued this far is clearly a biopolitical argument. <coughs> life can be improved only when you know the impact of your life practices. Be practical, be scientific, and you will know how the life of the lower classes and lower castes can be transformed. The annihilation of the system of discrimination this is the famous phrase, Ambedkar says the annihilation of caste. I'm saying the annihilation of the system of discrimination is the goal. And towards that, we must reconfigure the entire world in a systematic manner and not in a jerky manner. Revolution cannot be imagined without reconstruction. Revolution needs passion and mobilization. Reconstruction needs patience, open-mindedness, and both call for, closely, for close observation of and learning from life, lives that lower classes live, practice, and imagine. Thank you. for 30 minutes for discussion. I think there are several levels of, the, uh, of questions that we can probe into further. One is the uh, paradox uh, of collectivity. Collectivity in terms of conformity or in terms of the crowd in the street, the mob in the street, or uh, collectivity with solidarity. But Solidarity for whom? With whom? Okay, when we say uh, solidarity, how do we connect? How do we um, uh, stand together? What is the line of separation? Okay, that will also mean a paradox of the politics of responsibility. Re responsibility for whom? According to what law, what regulation? or the responsibility for the enlightenment project, or responsibility in the Hida term of responsive to authority or the others. But how? Okay. So also there's a question, practical ethics, or practical philosophy, or uh, philosophy through practice, philosophy ethics through practice. Okay, contingent uh, situation. How do we do that? Uh, one last question, I think, uh, is uh, also the question about law or the police, the police action. Uh, the police oftentimes can go beyond their duty or their role of, of as a protector for the citizens. The police will guard against uh, so-called the security of the city 
against the alien, against the migrant laborers, against uh, new found uh, 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 stateless persons, or new found uh, people with no citizenhood. Or the change of law by the government will make other part of the people become very precarious and unprotected and even attacked by the police, even they are citizens. So those are the uh, questions that will uh, come to my mind when I read his text and uh, listened to his talk. But I believe uh, we have a uh, uh, participant who wants to share. Let's collect questions and then you answer or address the question uh, in the end. Okay. Yes? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before engaging uh, the discussion, I would like really to thank uh, Joyce Liu and also uh, Brett Nelson uh, for always uh, inviting me to engage in this big family. <laughs> so um, I'm a newcomer to this field, so obviously uh, I came to learn from everybody. Uh, I really, I mean, really appreciate your talk. Talk about uh, uh, solidarity and responsibility. And my current paper is really, I mean, fancy about the concept of solidarity. Uh, but I, uh, I put it in a little bit, I mean, different, different way. I mean, when I heard uh, your talk, I mean, I, I, I could understand that uh, the concept of solidarity is a mediating. Uh, concept between uh, responsibility and governance. So it's still about how we deal with the power and how we look for, I mean, uh, certain, I mean, <laughs> certain progressive measure if we can imagine that part. Uh, but when I, uh, but I couldn't, I, I, I actually, I, I really agree that uh, solidarity is really came up from the moments of crisis. And this is exactly, I would like to work on that part. So uh, my current work actually work on a, a kind of m try to create a micro foundation of solidarity. But then I look for uh, I, when I when I work on that part, I look it from as a as a everyday life logic. Uh, I mean, the ordinary people, either they are migrants, either uh, they are uh, uh, they are uh, workers, I mean, or the grassroots. I mean, we. We rely on we rely on that everyday life logic to build a solidarity, and so I take it from as a logic of everyday life as well as a logic for activism. I mean, try to ground uh, uh, those uh, uh, current activist project because with, without solidarity, we can see thousands of thousands of people suddenly I mean emerge, and then next day they all disappear. That so so the so the solidarity for me is like is a logic of activism. It's a logic of how to ground uh, those activists' work. So, um, so it's, 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 it's trying to engage with, uh, I mean, with your work. But I really appreciate your talk. Over there, uh, in the back, maybe we pass on the mic. Uh, other hands, uh, let me see. Okay, here. Over there first. Over there, first and sec uh, second and third. And just raise your hand so that I can see. All right. Hello, my name is Benjamin. I'm a Swedish human rights activist. Thank you so much for your very important talk. I just wanted to briefly mention that me and Sana have been biking for over a year in solidarity with the biggest colony in the world, the last remaining colony in Africa, Western Sahara. And we invite you all to come to our talk at 12. It's not in the schedule, so I just wanted to mention that again. And my question for you is that uh, Kashmir is the most militarized area in the entire world with, I believe, 800,000 Indian soldiers there. And you didn't mention it in your talk, but talking about solidarity, do you have thoughts on solidarity with the people of Kashmir living under that military occupation? Yeah, Benjamin uh, is a uh, 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 Swedish uh, human rights activist, uh, solidarity rising for uh, uh, Sahara. Uh, the second one here, question here, and the third over there. All right. Hello, my name is Joshua. So, um, what was interesting for me is that move move towards the ethics of practice, or something that stems from from practice, which is of course 
a very interesting, but it can also be a dangerous idea that could maybe, in the second step, deprive those subaltern of something, like an ideology, for instance, if you analyze them through situational, practice-based moves of ethical behavior. Because recently, during the pandemic, we had lots of beautiful uh, practice-based actions, but, but right-wing and almost fascist collectives in some of the countries. And I remember thinking, oh my god, <laughs> my enemies are doing something now, and I'm sitting in my home obsessing over my gravy. Uh, am I the negative agent of history? And uh, how to interpret those moves without assigning ideological devices to them? Maybe they did it because they believe in collective, or they believe in saving creations, or whatever that is. Um, so how about those dilemmas uh, that stem from moving towards practice? Third question over there. Yeah. In other hand. Hello. Um, I had a very similar question uh, to Benjamin, uh, that how do we locate this solidarity and politics of ethics uh, <coughs> and the social stratification within uh, not just religious minorities and subaltern communities, but also the tribal minorities in India of Northeast India. So if you could also elaborate on that. Thank you. Professor uh, Santo. Uh, massage, here. Any other question? Okay, here. Okay, maybe the last, maybe. Uh, then over there, okay. Thank you very much, Rana. I really appreciated uh, your further uh, elaboration uh, uh, about uh, the notion of responsibility and the notion of uh, solidarity. You brought uh, uh, several uh, important political concepts uh, into play in uh, your thought, uh, including biopolitics. And uh, with respect to the pandemic, uh, you have been uh, thinking about the biopolitics from below. Uh, in your talk, uh, you uh, emphasize the need uh, to think uh, of uh, responsibility from the margin. Mm -hmm. It is uh, from this point of view that uh, I would like you to expand a bit uh, on uh, something that you said at the beginning of uh, your uh, talk and that uh, you did not really uh, develop. Uh, which means uh, sovereignty as uh, responsibility. You were saying that this is a neglected chapter of uh, uh, political theory and practice. Uh, I'm asking myself uh, uh, whether it is possible to include sovereignty in the constellation of concepts uh, that uh, you have been uh, uh, building up. And this is because uh, sovereignty operates from above. And so there is a kind uh, of uh, tension uh, and even contradiction between sovereignty and uh, uh, the other notions uh, you have been trying to rethink uh, from below or uh, from the margins. And uh, my uh, last question has to do with the, the relation between uh, uh, sovereignty, yeah? sovereignty as a responsibility, and uh, the nation yeah? as a kind of container uh, of practices of subaltern and solidarity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next one up uh, here, over here, and then a lady over there, perhaps the last, okay. Uh, we can continue our discussion afterwards, but a little for, the, for, for this round, and then Sandra can, oh, oh no, <laughs> Ramadan, uh, can, can address his questions, otherwise you will forget. Okay, yeah, please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Samadar, for this valuable speech. I would try this. Okay. 
And uh, actually, I have a lot of questions, and Sandra will help me to ask one of them. Uh, my question is, what impact does immigration and associated rights of cultural diversity have on feelings of belonging and solidarity? And the second question is, are there potential conflicts between individual autonomy and collective responsibility that need to, uh, that need to be addressed within political systems? Thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk very much. Um, I had a question about, I, I really appreciated your focus on the lower classes and people that are really struggling in terms of um, solidarity as a, a, a reaction to crises in very practical um, terms. And I was just wondering if you could talk about what happens when middle classes and upper classes commodify that solidarity, right? This sort of res this sort of solidarity watching of the things that they do as corporations, but also as people in social media, so that they feel like they are actually in solidarity, um, and then don't end up actually doing anything in terms of material um, economy and help. And so, is that a question that happens a lot in the United States? Sure, sure, sure. everywhere. Some of the questions are addressed or they relate to the paradox or the set of paradoxes that I uh, have mentioned. So I really have uh, uh, nothing much to add because I'm not saying that uh, solidarity is a kind of a panacea for, uh, you know, fallible human behavior. Uh, or that there has to be an ideology of solidarity. In fact, uh, the thrust of my argument has been that solidarity is a biopolitical phenomenon, if you look at biopolitics from below. I, ha I, had a, I have a wonderful friend, historian, British historian, who has worked on the history of firefighting in slums in Tunis, in Morocco, in Algiers, uh, he works in the Maghreb region. And I had a long discussion with him. And so you see, you know that these kinds of shanty settlements, they are mostly made of plastics, very inflammable. And it's only a matter of time that the settlement will catch fire, one thing or another. That it catches fire, so less is, is, a, is, a, is a wonder. It should take, catch fire daily for that thing. When that happens, uh, how do you see the relation between an individual autonomy and the collective responsibility? Uh, but th that's what I say, that if you study the practices very closely of the lower classes, much of the distinctions that we make are thought-induced, uh, they are uh, established ideological system induced, and they are of practically no relevance to the lives of the lower classes. Now, in this case, when the firefighting takes place, everyone has to come together. Uh, there are fantastic Hindi films. In fact, uh, there is a Hindi film by a person who made one film and died, Ravindra Dharmaraj, and in Chakra. And in Chapter, the, one of the characters, main character says, the whole problem of life is with belly and the underbelly. And the, and the story revolves around how do you cope with life in, in Islam. So that's why I say that it is a life question. And this is the reason why I'm saying that it's a biopolitical question. That it depends on how life is configured at that particular moment of crisis when an individual has to rush. And uh, Shomota would bear me out the instances that they were, there was not even a single instance that I was conjuring up. These are all uh, real instances. And these instances have come up from the work that CRG and its other associate institutions have done in the COVID time, etc. So, uh, 
the relation between autonomy and solidarity, as I told, it's not resolved by any uh, a length of explanation about the, dynam the dynamics of solidarity, because it's there, the, the, the paradox is there. But then how does the club secretary suddenly become, uh, who is usually a tough in the area, he suddenly becomes the lawgiver of the locality, and we were discussing law. So what you see at the level of the state, and in a way, Charles Steele's point is therefore right, that the contract between the power that is formed politically and the citizens who get protection, and Tilly says that it's a kind of a racket. He says that I have given you over, handed you over the power to impose tax precisely because you are protecting me. It's a racket. But even if we don't go to the extreme extent of uh, Tilly's argument, and Tilly's uh, very famous thing, where do rights come from? Absolutely a fascinating essay about forget all liberal talks. Liberalism did not give birth to rights. Rights came from extremely contentious and antagonistic histories of society. So that club secretary or the local tough, who in the corona time would say, lay down the law, that by 12 you should come back from doing whatever work you have to wash, you have to do. The migrant worker comes back, the migrant worker will not be allowed to enter the village or the slum, that he would be given uh, you know, shelter, maybe in a treetop, on a treetop, maybe in a boat that is anchored in the local water body. And the panchayat, that's the local body, would take the responsibility of feeding him. These are all absolutely multiple millions of small instances. But all of them tell that these are products of a particular time. And, and they, they momentarily resolve the paradox of autonomy and solidarity. But it's momentarily. Because as soon as that crisis of life seems to be over, things, you know, uh, go back to their thing. So that's something that I wanted to say. The other is that, therefore, you can see when I, uh, solidarity for whom? Because I am here speaking of self-responsibility, but not in the way Foucault said. Because in Foucault and the, uh, their ideas about biopolitics, the individual subject, the idea of the subject, they're ingrained. You, you cannot move away from that. But on the other hand, the subject that we are talking here, you call it the subjectification, you call it the subjections, etc. This is the, the life of the collective. A collective in distress. A collective we caught in an absolutely critical situation. As I said, it's a permanent state of injury. You take Wendy Brown's that famous phrase, states of injury. So it's a permanent state of injury. So, this is where my argument is that, that biopolitics is not merely a matter of governments doing this or that. It is, if you say that it's a matter of governmentality, I have no quarrel with that. But then this governmentality has to be rethought in the sense, how do poor people govern themselves? As I said, that when you think of the fire that breaks out let's say, four to five times per year in a, in a settlement, or flood comes in, disruption in electricity, boys and girls getting electrocuted. Now, in all these cases, some, there is a street accident. People would have to rush to take the, you know, the, the, the person who has suffered to the nearby hospital. Money is to... These things actually tell you that biopolitical responses are uh, practiced. So that's why I say that in that sense, Foucault is right that we have to learn much more from practice. And this was therefore my concluding remark that one has to learn it and, and it requires patience. It, it requires extreme patience. The last point on social stratification, I think I have told, because again in the slum or in the village, 
we cannot think that the that this village headman is a paragon of virtue he or she is enjoying social power because of the local elections because of probably his caste or her caste because of probably little bit of money because probably his or her family is as we call one of substance but at the same time precisely this power enables this figure to impose on society certain disciplines in terms of how you have to lead your collective life in order to cope with COVID. Or we can think of many other things. And when these populist parties, when they tell the local elites that in the, in the meeting, bring 1,000 people, bring to your quota is 2,000, etc. Now in India, in TV, they were repeatedly showing that uh, that these tea garden laborers, they are coming from North Bengal to a meeting um, that was to be addressed by the populist chief minister of Bengal. And these women were asked, tea garden laborers, why have you come? And you could see from the response of the TV, immediately those answers were dismissed and the main thing that was shown was that they were giving food. So where did the money came? As if these poor people, uh, they were getting food. Are we not having food here? We have come for a seminar. For us, this is so natural that we shall come, we shall do a day, a day of sightseeing, we shall come one day prior to that and we shall have good food. We had it yesterday. We'll have it today. But the moment uh, you think in terms of you transpose this behavioral model onto the lower classes, immediately this idea of a hungry and greedy laborer, etc., that, that, that comes out. So I don't think solidarity has therefore, I, I'm not saying it has not, nothing to do with social stratification, but my intent was to say these are external questions. They, 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 they do not decide the fate of solidarity. There are stratifications and yet at times the nation comes together, at times the human collectives come together or they form the collective. The last question I think Sandro's question is very important which is that uh, sovereignty as responsibility. The reason why I am still uh, uh, hesitant and I am not very sure of the line that I should take because sovereignty as responsibility, this theory has a very, uh, you know, uh, malign history. Uh, take the case of uh, Gladstone, uh, Turkish ulcer, Ottoman ulcer of Europe. And he said that we have power and we have the responsibility to, to protect the Christian subjects. Which is why China, Russia, all of them oppose the United Nations on the IDPs the UN idea of sovereignty as responsibility. So if you are responsible for uh, internally displacing, let us say, half a million people, then the foreign powers can intervene. And China says, oh, we will do everything that is required to bring this uh, nation to sense, etc. but we will not allow it. It's because this has a history. Classic is the French assassination of uh, the Libyan leader, Gaddafi. Again, irresponsible ruler, so sovereign powers killed him. Within the country also, same thing, that we have the responsibility to... That's why I say that colonial people also, the colonial power thought that we have to teach the Indians to responsibly behave. Because representation, the, 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 in our case, and I think in most of the colonial cases, Representation did not happen all at one day. So we had from late 1880s, where representative elections were allowed at smaller levels, at small towns, villages. Then in 1919, we had minority representation. That issue was tackled. And then in 1935, we had on the whole a modern constitution, Government of India Act through it. So, but again, you can see that government is educating Indians slowly, bit by bit, and teaching Indians how to behave responsibly, because they are now being given power. So 
self-responsibility and representation in political theory, they will go together. And they go together. I mean, if you think of Bart, if you think of, actually Bart was, Bart said that, you know, that um, how can you have uh, uh, self-responsibility, uh, representation without self-responsibility. So I'm a bit wary. On, uh, so therefore, uh, on the other hand, I do understand that sovereignty remains. And to say that sovereignty is by nature, therefore, irresponsible also goes against the grain of history, because countries do behave responsibly. So unless we are to take them as exceptions, we must come to terms with the contradiction here. And I think we cannot wish away, we, we cannot wish away the contradiction. It is there. But uh, how to go about it, as I said, that I'm not very sure I've been thinking of it. Listen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe that all the questions that we raise are questions we need to find answers for ourselves. And also we can find answers through, through discussion in the coming uh, five days. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>